All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here. This is a really exciting day and you're about to hear about all of the reasons why in just a second, but I just wanted to start out by saying thank you for being here for today's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffat and I'm the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center for in Newport, Oregon, which sounds a little weird to the folks in the room, but for folks that are online, thanks you so much for being here. This is a hybrid event. That means that we have folks that are joining us virtually as well. So for folks that are online, thanks for joining us. If you have any technical issues, uh, Katie is our volunteer for today. She's going to be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any technical issues, you can put those into the chat. Um, for those folks in the room, again, thanks for being here. If you didn't have a chance to sign in on your way in, remember that's how I get a bias all cookies. So make sure you sign in as you go out if you haven't yet. Um, so because this is a hybrid event, for folks that are online, we ask that you put your questions into the chat box and we will go through them at the end. Katie will read them out to today's speaker um, and we'll work through as many as we can in the time that we have allotted. For the folks that are in the room, we ask that you raise your hand at the end when we open up question and answer. And um, a couple of us are gonna run around and give you a mic so that the folks online can hear you. Just wanted to let you know that you will need a mic to ask those questions. So a couple of really quick announcements that I wanted to make. Um, we have a couple of really cool seminars and things coming up. So next week on May 11th, in celebration of World Migratory Bird Day, we have Susan Haig here who is going to be talking to us about um, communicating to policymakers about avian conservation. So that'll be kind of an interesting one. Um, and then I just want to do a save the date for our evening science on tap this month. That will be May 24th. And for that event, we'll actually have our Laverne Weber visiting scientist, Andy Reed from Duke University here, um, to talk about distangling science, policy, and conservation through the lens of the North Atlantic right whale. Um, and so that will be a really interesting one as well. Um, just wanted to let you all know that if you are interested in any of those events, you can go to the HMSC website, go to the events page, and you can see seminars and you can see Science on Taps there. I also just wanted to let folks know that we are recording today's event, um, and we hope we'll get that up maybe on Monday early next week. Um, so if you have somebody who would like to see today's event, uh, please feel free to share it. It will be on that past seminar page. But the reason we're all excited to be here today is that we have our um, this year's student invited speaker who is here with us. And so every year our students get a chance to invite one speaker that they think is going to um, influence their research, help their careers, and maybe change their perspective a little bit. And so we are thrilled that our student speaker is here. And so I'm gonna hand this off to um, one of the students that are here at Hatfield and she's gonna do our introductions. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Clara Bird. I'm co-president of the Hatfield Student Organization, which are the group of grad students that invited Donna here today. Um, and so the way the process works is that we nominate and vote on a speaker in the fall, and we are so thrilled that our top choice was able to come join us. It's been an awesome day. Um, and this event is financially and logistically supported by the director's office. So we wanna give a big thanks to Bob and all the director's office staff for all of their support. We so, so appreciate it. Um, so. Um, before I introduce her, we have a few logistics things. The first is that after seminar at 4.30, we ask that all the grad students please come down to the podium so that we can take a photo with Donna, um, but quickly before everyone else swarms her and asks questions. And then we invite everyone to join us at Wolf Tree um, for happy hour and some snacks to catch up with each other, Donna, and celebrate that it's spring. Okay, I think that's just about everything. Okay, so Dr. Donna Hauser received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD from the University of Washington, where she researched Southern resident killer whales and beluga whales. Now she's a research assistant professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks International Arctic Research Center. Her research is driven by a suite of questions addressing the environmental factors and ecological interactions that influence the responses of sentinel marine species to dynamic and rapidly changing marine ecosystems. In the Arctic, Dr. Hauser's research is focused on marine predator movement and behavior and her collaborations with the indigenous communities who rely on these systems directly affects conservation and management. 
Her research on sentinel species in a rapidly changing environment and spatial and temporal distributions of key predator species share themes with many HMSC community members, and we are so thrilled to have her here. So without further ado, Dr. Donna Hauser. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, before we officially get started, we want to present you with our certificate of being our HSO student invited speaker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can can you guys all hear me okay? Yeah. Is that a yes in the back? It looked a little okay. <laughs> Great. Um, well, it's been super fun, very interesting to be here today. Um, I am just incredibly honored for the invite from the graduate students here at Hatfield. And it's been really awesome learning about um, all of the different research and activities that folks are doing here. So thank you for the invitation and for um, bringing me here as a, on a visit. So let's see. Let's take a trip to the Arctic. Um, in the Arctic, warming is occurring four times faster than the rest of the globe. And sea ice is the most prominent and impactful signal of climate change. So here we're looking down at the top of the globe in this animation. And it's showing the area of Arctic annual sea ice minimum extent. So that typically occurs in the month of September and has been detected from satellites um, since 1979. So um, over the period that you're seeing here from 1979 to 2002, September sea ice cover has declined at a rate of about 12% per year, or sorry, per decade. Um, and they're associated with that, we're also seeing declines in sea ice thickness, the duration of cover and the timing, so the phenology of sea ice cover. And um, overall, I think that you know, the, the important context here is that Arctic marine ecosystems are in rapid transition because seasonal sea ice cover is the dominant physical feature that um, is structuring marine ecosystem function. And it's particularly profound in certain parts of the, the Arctic. And so here, um, let's focus in on the Chukchi and Beaufort Sea regions of the Pacific Arctic. Um, which has ex experienced pr particularly profound sea ice loss. Um, the Chukchi Sea off Northwest Alaska has de declined dramatically. Um, sea ice extent in September is now only 10% of what it was in the 1980s. And associated with sea ice loss, we're seeing um, increasing sea surface temperatures. Um, it's been particularly warm in recent years. Um, in some cases along the West coast of Alaska, um, surface waters um, have been four to 11 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer in recent years than the historical average. Um, part of my reason also in sort of zooming in right away in the Pacific Arctic here is to emphasize something that I think a lot of Americans miss, which is that we're an Arctic country because of Alaska and um, its geographic position. And um, so, if the state of Alaska is what makes the US an Arctic nation, I also wanna show this map of Alaska native languages because it really shows how all of Alaska comprises the homelands of Alaska's first peoples. Um, there are currently 227 federally recognized and sovereign tribes in Alaska. And so um, before I go any further, I wanna take a moment just to set my own positionality and entering the work that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, my parents were white settlers on Denina land so I grew up in Anchorage and um, I, and in growing up in Alaska, I really also grew a deep passion for Alaska's people and places and wildlife. And so uh, I wanna acknowledge that I've been fortunate to live, work and raise my family on the homelands of the Lower Tanana Dene people in Fairbanks. UAF is located on a ridge that's called Tresquieta and that's been recognized historically as a place to um, come together to work and think together. And so I think that's really symbolic. And um, I'm kind of just wondering, can anybody tell me whose native land we're on here in Newport? I don't, I didn't get a chance to look that up beforehand. Okay, well, so if you're interested in finding 
out whose native land you're on, um, check out this, this link, nativeland.ca. Um, another point of this map is to show that the first people of Arctic Alaska have been there tracking, adapting, and responding to environmental change since time immemorial. And so in, through this talk, I'm gonna talk about developing research partnerships that bring together diverse worldviews, perspectives, and information so that we can generate new and novel insights about this rapidly changing ecosystem. So just a little more context framing Arctic marine ecosystem changes. And again, we come back to sea ice. So again, it's this dominant physical feature that is structuring marine ecosystem function. And so historically, what would happen is that we would have a really short summer season, sea ice retreats right around when solar radiation is increasing. We get um, these, gener this generates these phytoplankton blooms and localized lower level trophic, um, trophic lower trophic level productivity, um, which then can fuel what's relatively short um, Arctic food chain. So ultimately that's affecting the um, foraging opportunities for epitrophic level consumers and predators like marine mammals. So my research uh, has been particularly focused on the seven endemic Arctic marine mammal species. Um, these are primarily at the top or near the top of the Arctic food chain, but they rely on sea ice either directly um, as a platform to give birth to their pups, so for reproduction, um, but also for foraging, or else indirectly or also indirectly um, in terms of habitat use and um, migration and migration timing. Uh, these are also important species because they're what I would argue sentinel species um, whose e ecology is really integrating the changes that are occurring in the Arctic, and they're culturally and ecologically critical to Arctic marine ecosystems. And Arctic marine mammals are also increasingly at risk. Um, there's new anthropogenic pressures um, that are taking advantage of these changes in sea ice cover, right? So that could be the rapid increase of the number of vessels transiting the Bering Strait, um, where Arctic marine mammals are found to be two to three times more vulnerable to vessels than anywhere else in the Arctic. And then, of course, um, across the Arctic, marine mammals are food. They're um, critical cultural and spiritual components of the indigenous way of life. And so um, I think often there's sort of this assumption that if there's impact of climate change or sea ice loss on marine mammals or the marine ecosystem, that this will then also affect the people and the community's reliance on them. And um, so in the next, you know, what, 30 minutes or so, <laughs> um, I'll discuss a few projects where we focused on tracking rapid ecosystem changes in the Alaska Arctic, um, as well as the impacts to marine mammals um, that are the focus of some of these coastal indigenous uh, communities. Um, I also have just kind of used this opportunity to reflect on um, sort of my journey. And, um, you know, I'm a marine biologist by training, but um, I've been learning from and working with indigenous knowledge holders over the past few years. And it's really been transformational for um, the way that I approach science. So what is indigenous knowledge? Um, I'm gonna lean on a definition of indigenous knowledge from the Inuit Circumpolar Council, um, that it's a uniquely valuable way of knowing. It's holistic and integrative. Carolina Behe from ICC has described this like a puzzle where all the pieces need to fit together for a healthy ecosystem. And that healthy ecosystem includes indigenous knowledge holders and culture as one critical component of the ecosystem. Indigenous knowledge can be systematic. It's also a living and evolving process. So evidence is directly acquired over extended timescales because it's shared over generations via cultural transmission. So with the, just starting with that recognition that indigenous knowledge contributes valuable perspective and unique perspective, I think there's been a challenge of combining Western or convention, conventional science um, with indigenous knowledge. Um, and one of the challenges I think people recognize is that there's maybe these like mismatching scales. So in general, indigenous knowledge is considered to be, you know, relatively localized in terms of spatial scales, but time deep because of this um, sharing over generations. Scientific research um, could look over a broad spatial scale, but may only take place over a shorter season or even just a few years. 
So some of these differences in scaling also provide opportunity when you combine them because information can be synergistic or complementary. So let's explore that a little bit more. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna discuss a recent example of how we can equitably and ethically weave Western and indigenous science through co-production of knowledge approaches. Um, building on that, we can look into a case study showing intersecting issues of recent sea ice loss affecting marine mammal habitat, um, the changing access and as changing access and availability for traditional marine resources for hunters. And then I'll end um, with a bit of a discussion of some other opportunities to elevate community-driven research partnerships um, that track and respond to Arctic environmental change. Okay, so in Alaska, at least, there's a lot of talk about co-production of knowledge. It's become a bit of a buzzword. Um, and it's just particularly in the context of Arctic research with indigenous communities. Um, but co-production of knowledge, that concept has been around for a long time. It's historically been framed as an interdisciplinary approach. Um, so stakeholders get involved um, in actionable science. And um, so we're building on that. We're using a model from uh, Julie Raymond Jacobian, Rachel Daniel, and Carolina Behe, um, who've developed this framework. Um, they've applied sort of that traditional approach to co-production um, by further embodying and culturally responsive concepts. Um, and you can see that equity is centered across all components of this process. And so um, let me introduce the Ikagvik Sukukin project. Um, Ikagvik Sukukin is, uh, translates to ice bridges in Inupiaq and um, had the overarching goal of bridging science and indigenous communities to study sea ice change in Arctic Alaska. Um, the project was focused in Kotzebue Sound in Northwest Alaska and had the centerpiece of, co of taking a, a co-production of knowledge approach. So hopefully I'll play this short video. This is Sikorak Whiting. Um, she is the, the executive director of the native village of Kotzebue. And she's talked about how our project started and has been unique for the community of Kotzebue. And this was recorded in a hangar um, at like an airplane hangar. So hopefully the audio comes out okay. Let me know if you want the volume up. So, you know, the overarching goals were to connect with the community of Kotzebue. We brought an interdisciplinary team of scientists to the table. Um, we had expertise in oceanography, sea ice geophysics, atmospheric sciences, and marine biology. So um, we were also, I should also note, we were followed by an ethnographic filmmaker uh, over the duration of the project. So um, here I'm just including the, the overall four-year timeline. And hopefully what you can see is that there's sort of this um, repetitive and iterative nature to our interactions to work collaborati collaboratively with the community and also um, a council of elders. So we had um, an elder advisory council which the local tribe identified. They guided us through every step of the research, um, all the way from the development of the actual research questions and the collection of data to the interpretation and sharing out of our results. So they're included as co-authors on all of the papers and all of our products. Um, yeah. Uh, we had a number of diverse field approaches as well. Um, so of course the, the indig local indigenous knowledge, we also brought some long range drones to do some of the research. We took measurements on top of the ice and under the sea ice. Um, we deployed some oceanographic moorings. 
We took habitat surveys for ring seals on the ice. And um, as I mentioned, we had a, a documentarian following us as well. So like the earlier video showed, we didn't come to Casibu as a scientific team armed with specific research questions or hypotheses or objectives. We worked with the native village of Kotzebue to establish this elder advisory council. Um, and during our first visit as team leaders, we met repeatedly with the elder advisory council. Um, our initial visits to Kotzebue were focused just on building relationships, getting to know each other, um, and then learning about the questions and concerns of the elder hunters in the community as it related to sea ice change. Um, we moved our first meetings out of the, the um, conference room at the, at the tribe and into this classroom that you're seeing here, um, which was actually a satellite campus of UAS. Um, and so we literally started sketching ideas on a whiteboard, um, research questions on a whiteboard, and we were lucky to have funding that was open enough that really the only initial bounds to this, the scope of this project were a focus temporally on um, the spring breakup period and then geographically on the marine areas of Kotzebue Sound. So um, as I mentioned, we, you know, we've had a diversity of experiences and in terms of the science and tools that we brought to the table. Um, and out of this process, we had five overarching research questions that emerged um, that related to things like sea ice, um, related to sea ice loss, um, but also in terms of like the breakup process, ocean conditions and warming, um, and the roles that rivers play in breakup and sediment transport. Um, and then of course, uh, the marine mammals that hunters rely on as some of their most important traditional resources. We ended up with six overarching questions. Um, and of course, many of them focused on marine mammals. And um, today I'll just kind of focus on one of them um, to shift into this next section of the talk um, that der derived from the second question, which was really a, a case study of how we put this co-production of knowledge model into practice. So I think we'll... The last two years, I've had a lot of questions. So it's so different that I don't need that That was one of our elders, Ross Schaefer, um, who I think sort of sets the, the context pretty well. Um, bearded seals or Ugruk are a large Arctic pinniped. They're one of three ice obligated ice seal species in the Pacific Arctic. They use sea ice platforms uh, to give birth to their pups in the spring. Um, they also use these ice flows in the spring to haul out on and rest in between foraging bouts. And then later in the spring, they're using sea ice as a platform for molting as well. So a lot of energetically costly um, behaviors and activities occurring on the ice in the spring. They use Kotzebue Sound as an important spring habitat area because it's a relatively shallow region. Um, and there's lots of productive benthic foraging opportunities for, for Ugruk. Um, and so of course, Kotzebue hunters also leverage this habitat use in the spring. They rely on, on bearded seals more than any other marine resource. Um, and here you can actually see in the picture, they, they, they dry uh, what they call black meat and um, store it in, in render the oil. And so that's like a delicacy and used throughout the year. So um, this, this question really, again, centers on issues of changing habitat, phenology, and related issues of access and availability to hunters, where the overarching questions for this section were to investigate how bearded seal spring hunting seasons have changed in Kotzebue Sound and what environmental factors influence the length of the hunting season. Uh, this was an analysis that was co-led um, by, Alex, by Alex Whiting uh, with me. So I, I showed you some graphics of fall sea ice extent. Here we're looking at the spring historical records of sea ice concentration in the Chukchi Sea region, um, including Kotzebue Sound. So the figure is a little bit complicated, but what you're seeing um, is monthly uh, average sea ice concentration in the Chukchi Sea region for May on the top 
June in the middle and July on the bottom. Um, the take home really is that historical sea ice patterns have changed such that um, now what used to be the ice concentration in May, it's now resembling more what the conditions historically were like in June or July. So some pretty dramatic changes in, in sea ice concentration. And um, so to take that and understand some of the environmental factors affecting the harvest period for bearded seals, we combined three different information sources. First, looking at tribal hunting records. Um, so that was when the spring harvest period started and ended each year from 2003 to 2019. We relied on the indigenous knowledge of our elders to tell us about what sea ice conditions were important for bearded seal habitat, but then also in terms of access and availability for hunters. And then use that information to go into some uh, remotely sensed sea ice data um, as explanatory factors. So I'll just walk through each of those briefly. Um, so since 2003, Alex Whiting has been keeping a regular journal of the hunting activities in the region and um, the associated environmental conditions. And so that ultimately provided this critical time series for the harvest se season, recording the start date and the end date for when people were hunting each year, um, from which we estimated the duration of the hunting season. And then our elders were indicating several factors affecting the habitat and timing of bearded seals in Kotzebue Sound, as well as the ability of hunters to access them. So, you know, as I mentioned, Kotzebue Sound is this important um, spring foraging area for, for bearded seals. And so bearded seals need to be able to enter Kotzebue Sound. So the ice needs to open up and break up enough um, to create what, what the elders call white ice. So these platforms that they rest on. Um, and then there needs to be sort of persistent white ice um, to rest and haul out. And so it needs to persist for some period of time. Then hunters need those broken ice flows for the hunters to see to rest on as well, um, because they only harvest seals that are on ice. They don't they don't shoot seals that are in the water because they sink. Um, so those platforms are really important for the hunters as well. Um, they need to be able to access the bearded seals by boat, and so that actually means that they need to wait until the channel in front of town opens so they can launch their boat. Um, and then, of course, they prefer broken ice flows that are in close proximity to town because those are safer and more affordable hunts um, that can be accomplished in shorter trips. So ultimately, what we heard was that um, Ugric and Kotzebue Sound are so closely tied to the sea ice conditions that hunting bearded seals is actually like hunting the ideal ice conditions. So we took that and um, looked to the sea ice data each year. Um, we use MODIS daily satellite imagery to estimate a time series um, for the day each year when these annual events occurred in the ice cycle based on sort of that information from the Elder Advisory Council. So um, we were specifically looking at like this region, when did that open? For that was an indicator of when bearded seals could enter Kotzebue Sound. They, we looked at this channel, really clear signal in the satellite imagery so that they could, that's when they could have launched their boats. Um, we looked at this region close to Kotzebue, um, where presumably bearded seals would be more accessible. And then we looked at, for the entire Kotzebue Sound, when did that completely empty of the ice as well? So we got time series for all of these um, different parameters. Okay, so if we look just at the tribal records, we can see, we can quantify that the spring bearded seal hunting period for Kotzebue Sound um, has significantly decreased um, nearly a day per year over the past 17 years, if we're looking across this entire trend. Um, and if we look at this sort of in another way, uh, you can see the shift overall to shorter harvest periods through time. And um, so the start date has gotten a little bit earlier over time, but it's is really driven by the overall decrease, or sorry, the overall decrease in the hunting season is really driven by the earlier end to the hunting season. So the last day of the hunt, has gotten about one and a half days earlier per year over this time series. Um, and on average, it's now ending about 26 days earlier now than it did in the 2000s, so about a month earlier. So when we combine the information on hunting season and duration with the trends in sea ice events that the elders identified, uh, we found that hunteration in particular was influenced by a combination of access to bearded seals at both the beginning and end of the harvest periods in some ways not so surprising so but so specifically this was the dates when the channel in front of town opened and cleared of ice so boats could launch and then 
the last day when Kotsky Sound emptied of all of the ice, which meant that all of the seal habitat also disappeared. And so I think sort of just if you just stop there, I think the assumption would be that hunters would have reduced success um, given the sh shortened hunting season. But I'm going to walk through just to give you a little bit more content context um, to talk through an example from the 2019 season. So to, paradoxically, that wasn't the case. Um, in 2019, that was the lowest sea ice extent on record that winter. Kotzebue Sound didn't completely cover um, with ice, which was unheard of by the elders. Um, and the channel also broke up really early um, on May 13th, which is what you can see in this picture. Um, that was the earliest that the elders could ever remember being able to get out and go hunting. And then at the, at the end of the season, um, in terms of the end of the season, there was this little tiny section of um, sea ice that actually grounded on a sandbar, which is less than 10 miles from Kotzebue. And so these chunks of ice were important for two things. One, these were the main sea ice flows you can see in the satellite image. Um, these were the main ice that was available in the majority of the Chukchi Sea that spring. And so bearded seals were packed onto this little bit of ice, um, really high density. And so this was really close to Kotzebue. Hunters could go out for just a few hours, know exactly where the seals were. Um, and uh, ultimately they had a really short season. You can see this is just a couple of weeks later than that previous image, um, but, uh, but very, hunters were really successful in this uh, short 2019 season. So just a couple of conceptual diagrams uh, to summarize some of this work. Um, so in the past, Kotzebue Sound was reliably covered by sea ice until we, we started to see open water. That typically started a cap happening in May, um, but the sea ice habitat for bearded seals would usually persist into July. Hunters would have to go on longer and farther trips. They often navigated really complex sea ice flows and searched for ugrets, ugric that were um, pretty dispersed. Um, but the sea ice patterns have changed in Kotzebue Sound. So we have this earlier loss of sea ice. Um, they, the hunters are embarking on shorter, more frequent trips. Um, that actually requires less gear, less gas, and um, hunters are generally really successful. So in the 2019 example, the hunters had particularly low effort for really high success. Um, and so just sort of overall, I think it was only through this ability to combine different information sources that we were able to show that even though these harvesting opportunities are decreasing with climate change, that, that, that hunting season has gotten shorter, hunters are so far compensating um, by changing their effort. So um, taken together, I think this is providing an example of the holistic breadth of knowledge in communities. They have systems in place for tracking Arctic change, but we've also generated new insights because of the opportunities to weave indigenous and scientific perspectives. Um, so for example, without the insights from the elders, we wouldn't necessarily have considered even the most appropriate events in the spring sea ice cycle that affect both seals and hunters. Um, so I think, you know, part of the success in terms of a co-production of knowledge example uh, for the Ecogvik Sakukin project was really based on our ability to, to build these trusting relationships, to listen to each other, and recognize the value of different ways of knowing. Uh, there's lots of ways to learn more about this project, um, and I've only touched on a small portion in some ways. <laughs> um, so we've had several papers where you can learn more. Um, so in particular, things like changing ring seal reproductive habitat quality, the oceanography of the spring breakup in Kotzebue Sound, um, how we measured particularly thin sea ice in combination with deep snow, which ultimately contributed to surface flooding of the sea ice that has impacts for not only marine mammal habitat, but the safety of traveling by snow machine on the ice. And then um, also some, some uh, measures of radiative properties of sea ice um, as a surface so we can understand the melt processes as well. Um, there's a series of short films. I showed you a few snippets from those, but um, the filmmaker Sarah Betcher has actually created also a feature length film that you can, you can find on YouTube as well.
So now I'm just going to take the, the last few minutes to trans transition and discuss um, some other opportunities, I think, for elevating community driven research partnerships to track and respond to Arctic environmental change. And in particular, tell you about a project that I lead um, in, with communities in northern coastal Alaska, um, developing an Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub. But first, I'll just start by recognizing again that I'm speaking on behalf of a huge and wonderful collaborative team um, that includes several Inupiaq knowledge holders and as observers, um, UAF scientists, graduate students, postdocs, other researchers, um, and then we're guided by a steering group that's composed of indigenous leaders as well as academics at UAF. So we call this a community-based observing project, and I'll just briefly define that in the context of this project. So our um, coordinated community-based observing efforts provide this opportunity for documenting um, environmental conditions at the local scale. And through partnerships with indigenous community members, these observations become rooted in indigenous worldviews. So it's representing local perspectives, stewardship, and kinship to the land. And over time, um, I think these, be, these observations become a powerful record of the changing conditions and what it means, the implications for these communities. So um, the Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub, or what, what we call AOK for short, I'll refer to it as that. Um, <laughs> AOK is a big project um, and a key component is really focused on this network of local observers from communities across the Chukchi and Beaufort Sea coasts. Uh, these observers lead traditional Inupiat ways of life based on the land and sea. And as part of AOK, observers document near daily observations um, of things like the ocean conditions, sea ice conditions, weather and wind, um, as well as observations of fish and wildlife and birds. Um, here, our Tikigak or uh, Point Hope observer Guy Omnik reflects by saying, Global warming is happening. It's affecting different villages in different ways. I collect observations as an important tool for the future. We can look back on these observations in years to come and compare if there are any dramatic changes. And I actually, I think that's a, like, I love using that quote because I think it really summarizes a lot of what we're trying to do with this project. Um, it's also an ongoing project. So it originally evolved out of a previous effort called the Seasonal Ice Zone Observing Network or SizoNet. Um, and that project started in 2007. Um, so Sizonet was a, a little bit more focused on sea ice and sea ice services and safety of sea ice um, and partnered with St. Lawrence Yupik and Inupiat sea ice experts who were providing regular observations. And so through AOK, we're building on that foundation. Um, AOK started officially in 2015. And we still work with some of the original observers like Joe Mello Levitt in the bottom here, bottom, uh, bottom left, sorry bottom right for you. Um, <laughs> uh, so Joe's been, you know, giving us observations um, since 2007. And in total, there are nearly 10,000 local observations from our indigenous observers um, share, stored in our shared AOK and Sizonet archives. Here's an example from Billy Adams, one of our Utiagvik observers, um, just to give you an example of sort of what an observation may look like. There are narrative descriptions of weather, ice, and ocean conditions, as well as usually a photo or multiple photos that are geotagged. So, you know, in this observation, Billy is telling us about where he is, um, some of the activities. So they're talking about whaling crews, um, talking about ice conditions, um, the safety of that ice, talking a little bit about the weather, that they harvested uh, ring seals, and, you know, that that's a, a good thing for families in Yagbek. So there's kind of a lot going on in just one of the, some of these little observations. Um, and I'll just point out, I'll try to add a few, there's a few other observations and photos from the observers kind of in the rest of the talk here too. Um, so AOK has, this is a, a schematic to just sort of show you that we have a diverse set of observations and observing protocols. Um, again, the cornerstone is really these local observations, but in addition to the narrative observations, we have several, um, what I often call special projects. <laughs> so these are addressing specific interests that might come up in a given community. So um, for example, you know, we are helping take ocean measurements. Um, we also help 
map and measure sea ice thickness along trails that are built on the sea ice, so snow machine trails built on the sea ice for whaling and Utsiagvik during spring. And, um, and you can see on the map on the bottom left here, the five current communities that are part of AOK. And this, you know, in some ways looks small, but it spans 1500 kilometers of the Northern coastal um, range of, of Arctic Alaska from Kotzebue to Kotkovik. So um, this is a busy slide. Let me walk you through it a little bit. Um, and really the goal is to show an example of weaving some of these narrative observations, in this case from Kotzebue. Um, with some of the oceanographic or CTD measurements that were taken um, using a, a handheld RBR CTD instrument um, in Kotzebue. So this is from, um, so the top row is the time series of salinity, temperature is the second, and productivity is the third there. Um, so these are salinity, temperature, and productivity at depth um, from April to August in 2019. So you can think back to that 2019 example that I talked about earlier too. Um, so again, you know, that was a remarkable year uh, in terms of um, really low sea ice extent in the Chukchi Sea region. And um, what you can start seeing here is that uh, in April, we start seeing some incursions of salty ocean water under the ice, so warm, warm ocean water coming in. Um, and then we get sea ice breakup on May 13th, and that's that same image, and it actually has a quote from uh, one of our steering group members in Katibu talking about the, the opening of the, um, the channel. They started bearded seal hunting, and he quotes his dad, who's an, an elder elder, <laughs> um, who remembered May 28th as the earliest that he had ever hunted before that. So that was May 13th, 2019. Um, let's see. So then you also see that the rivers are breaking up. We get this influx of river water. We get a phytoplankton bloom. And then really warm waters persisting into July. On July 19th, our observer Bobby was talking about how they had such warm waters, not just in the rivers, but in Coxview Sound itself. It got so warm that subsistence species king crab split is what he says, right? So they left Coxview Sound where they usually are. Um, they moved to deeper and colder waters in mid-July. And that was unusual, that was a first. Um, the CTD measurement was 64 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with very little sal salinity. He called that crazy. By mid-August, there was still really warm. It actually looks like we capture a secondary uh, phytoplankton bloom, which is pretty unusual in the Arctic. Um, and then we get reports of birds that elders had never seen before. And these are shearwaters, right? So um, I think many of you probably are familiar with, like, there was a massive seabird die-off event in the region in 2019 associated with this marine heat wave, and we saw a lot of emaciated birds. And so um, this elder Cyrus was talking about, you know, these shearwaters that he'd never seen before. Being, he called them hungry. They were following around um, boats. So, um, so anyways, I, I think that the point that I'd like to draw with this, this slide is really that we're supporting communities by providing scientific instruments like CTDs, which can collect measurements um, that when we partner them with the Inupiat observations, it really gives us a more complete picture of what's happening in the changing environment. Uh, we have three kind of priority areas for AOK, -OK, which is first to just continue to provide compensation. So we provide monthly stipends for our observers um, to sustain and support their observing efforts. Um, so we want to continue, and we want to provide continuity for that. Um, we're also working to create educational opportunities for the next generation of Indigenous scholars and leaders, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then lastly, thinking about how can these observations be useful and usable, particularly within communities, to support um, local priorities. Um, I think one of the, the, the like benefits or awesome things about AOK -okay is that we're, you know, being coordinated by a university, we can work on engagement by providing work and research and student funding um, opportunities to UAF graduate and undergraduate Alaska Native students. Um, so these are just some of our current and recent students. Each student comes to the table with their own disciplinary interests, um, and then they link into our AOK -okay project. And so um, that can provide a space for some peer mentorship and support as well. Um, here's just a quote from, from Mikuk Lindley. Uh, Mick says, because of the longstanding trusted relationship with AOK, -OK, 
um, that AOK has built with observers, I've been able to learn from people across the Arctic who are eager to support us students and our work through AOK, something I wouldn't otherwise have. It's given me a lot of confidence in developing my identity as a Western natural scientist and an indigenous person to learn from other indigenous people who support me in my work. Um, Roberta Turek Glenn uh, developed this really cool digital storytelling tool as part of her thesis called a story map. Um, the link is here. And, um, and so some of her reflection is that so often in popular media, indigenous communities in Alaska are described from the perspective of people who don't live there. The rhetoric around climate change in Alaska indigenous communities has been molded by the perspective of outsiders who lack the understanding of what it means to be living through these changes every day. And so it was rewarding for, for Roberta to be able to prioritize and elevate the voices and observations from AOK observers who describe these impacts in their own words and reflect on them in their reports. Um, so this was just one component of Roberta's graduate thesis that she finished last summer. Um, and I'm we're super fortunate that she's stuck around. She's, um, we've hired her as staff now. So she leads our AOK team in terms of project coordination and community as a community liaison. Um, I encourage you to go check out the story map at the link here. Um, and you'll see some of the themes that she's put together in terms of like warming air and ocean temperatures, increasing winds related to storminess, um, coastal erosion, and of course, impacts of sea ice loss. Um, all collated with sort of the from the perspective of um, AOK observers. Okay, so um, as the projects evolved over the past several years, I think there's been essentially what we've identified as five core functions that have emerged um, in, as as being an observatory and a knowledge hub. So first, of course, the importance of sustaining these observations to document and track and synthesize um, Arctic environmental change but then also to communicate and share these observations, um, what they mean and um, implications from, from the indigenous knowledge holders perspective. We focused on education and outreach, um, in particular thinking about how we can sort of move over and make space for some of these indigenous scholars and their leadership going forward. Um, we're working to create connections. Um, we can serve as an interface for scientists and agencies and others who wanna engage with some of these indigenous led observations. And then lastly, we are continuing, I think this is the area that needs the most work and we're continuing to push on the most is community led responses. So like, how can we, we can support um, indigenous led responses to the environmental change that, that's occurring in the Arctic. So um, some of the ways that we're sort of exploring these future needs and approaches um, are to uh, think about local scale decision making needs and how they can be played placed into like the context of things like tribal adaptation or tribal climate adaptation planning. Um, we're working with some of the marine mammal co management organizations in Alaska to move the dial towards more indigenous led um, marine mammal co management and then thinking also, of course, about broader connections at a pan Arctic scale so scaling up these observations in other places across the Arctic. So um, again, a few different ways to learn more um, through our website. We have a really active Facebook page for this organ or for this project because um, it turns out that a lot of rural Alaska is on Facebook. So um, this is one of our best ways to, to sort of support communication and share back what's going on um, with the observations and with, with our activities. And I'll just end with a couple more quotes. Um, first here from Bobby Schaefer. He's a current AOK observer and also with a member of our Elder Advisory Council in, in, uh, for Ikagvik Sikikin. Uh, Bobby has a real sense of urgency. He says, we can't shut our eyes to climate change. It's not going to go away. We have to change what we're doing. Otherwise, there's no hope. So he's kind of got a, a, a sort of a negative view going forward. But I think his point is that getting people to understand the importance of climate change um, is important because we're talking about future, future generations who are gonna live it. So he's really thinking about his kids and his grandkids. Um, Cyrus Harris also talked about the importance of valuing different ways of knowing um, and how indigenous people have been observing their environment since time immemorial and says, indigenous people from way back in the day have always studied the climate and the weather as a way of survival. 
gives them an idea of what conditions are going to look like for harvesting and certain areas for traveling. Um, another Cotabio elder, John Goodwin, said that we worked as a team. It wasn't one-sided. It was not only from the science department. The project at Cogvik Sukukin worked with the locals and with us elders. And by doing that, you get better results. And I, I really love this quote from John because I think he really hits the nail on the head about getting better results. And um, for me personally, these projects have been transformational in how I approach my work in marine ecology. Um, as a marine mammal scientist working in Alaska, climate change has visceral impacts. Marine mammals are, you know, such a part of the culture. And so we need the, all of the data and the information that's available. And we, in fact, need to embrace these opportunities to work together with knowledge holders. And um, these are the people that are on the front lines of climate change. So um, I, I think that, you know, just overall, I'd end by highlighting that research originating with indigenous knowledge and accounting for local values also has the potential to lead to more inclusive, more sustainable, and ultimately equitable outcomes in the face of this rapid and accelerating um, change in Arctic. So um, with that, I'll say teku if you're in Kotzebue, koinakpak if you're in Utkagvik, and thank you if you're in Newport. All right, thank you so very much. We're gonna try to get through some questions and we're gonna bounce back and forth between folks that are online and folks in the room. So Katie, any questions online? All right, for those folks that are online, go ahead and put your questions into the chat box and we can work through them. All right, folks in the room, I saw a hand go up. Fabulous work and great presentation. Um, my question has to do with, um, I guess, the bearded seal work. Um, you've got an ice obligate marine mammal. You've got what you've shown is at least, you know, an actual increase in opportunities for hunting. Mm -hmm. But you didn't really speak about, you know, the combined sort of effects on the overall population. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because you've got shrinking ice, maybe an increase, at least in one area for hunting opportunities. Mm -hmm. What's going on with the population and its effects? Yeah, excellent question. So um, there's a lot of variability in the uh, effects of sea ice loss on ice obligate species across Arctic Alaska. So um, what's some of the things, so we don't actually, to answer your question in terms of populations, we don't have great information on population status or trends. Um, they're really understudied in that sense. But um, in the summers of 2018 and 2019, again, really warm, unprecedentedly low sea ice conditions, there were unusual mortality events um, with a lot of the ice associated seals, including bearded seals. And so further south in the Bering Sea, um, there is definitely this like, decrease in hunting opportunities, as well as potentially more impacts to bearded seals um, than what you know we were seeing necessarily in Kotzebue Sound. And then actually, if you continue further north to the North Slope of Alaska, you know, hunters in Utkiagvik, like Billy Adams, that I showed you the picture of, he's like, seals are healthy, there's lots of them, they're super abundant. And so um, I think it's like getting at sort of that variability spatially and maybe temporally. Um, is going to be sort of one of the keys that we need to continue to push on. Um, so one of the ways that we're hoping to do that through the AOK project going forward is actually specifically in partnering with the co-management organization, the ICEAL committee, um, that um, to, to have them set into place to like use the AOK model to create their own metrics of like, okay, is, when you harvest a seal or when you want to go harvest a seal, is it healthy? Will you eat it? what metrics are you measuring? And so then create a system for them to actually document that and track it through time so that they can bring that to the table. And you'll start to see, like you hear really different stories from hunters in the Bering Sea region and Norton Sound than you do from Utkiagvik, like I said. So, um, so yeah, that's like, I think one of the ways that we can try to learn a little bit more about that. But the other piece that I didn't really talk about, and you can, you can dig into a little bit in the paper about the bearded seal example, um, 
you know, so that was the 2019 example. We can also envision a future where there will be even less ice or maybe no ice, or the ice might not ground on that sandbar. And so not only would there be less ice, but hunters still have to go farther. So we kind of talk about that a little bit more in the paper as well, kind of gloss over it for this. Katie, any questions? Questions in the room? All right, I'm gonna be selfish and ask my own question. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about data transfer from your observers to a central database, uh -huh. how narrative information and in the um, instrumentation data gets transferred. Uh -huh. um, does that have to be translated or just curious about how that works? Yeah, so we, um, and are you talking specifically sort of about ethical issues associated with that or just? I'm thinking about management of such a database, but yeah. that's coming from my perspective. Yeah. Um, so we have partnered. I mentioned that that has uh, been built, that the AOK project has been built on a foundation from the Seasonal Ice Zone Observing Network, a predecessor program. And um, SkyZoneNet, that program built a partnership with another organization called the Exchange for Local Observations and Knowledge of the Arctic, ILOCA. So um, they're part of the National Snow and Ice Data Center. It's a NSF supported data center. And so they've essentially created, they're the platform where all of our observations are stored. We have a specific data use agreement um, that the observers have, have all you know, signed off on essentially provided their consent. Um, and um, so users can then go and access the database assuming that they agree to the data use agreement and um, the context and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's, there's a whole, that's a whole system. I have a whole postdoc working on building our database up to be more and more useful and usable, particularly by people in communities. So yeah, the ethical part then, do you have to um, group? I mean, you were using individual quotes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, um, you know, we ask for consent from our observers to be able to share all of those sorts of things, right? And um, and for the most part, they want their knowledge to be used. They want their observations. They want their quotes to be out there. They love that there's a platform for like sharing the fact that of what's happening in their communities. Um, you heard saw that quote from Bobby Schaefer, like he he wants people to do something about climate change. <laughs> Um, so, um, so yeah, I think in general, uh, folks are really happy to have their observation shared and used. Um, we just went through some work, this, a workshop this past, uh, past November, where we were specifically asking like, what are, who are the audiences that you want to be using your observations? Are there audiences that you're worried about using your observations? And so there were some really interesting things that came out of that. Of course, they want youth and people in their community, um, school children. Um, but so agencies was an interesting one, right? So they want government agencies to be using their observations, but they also have some concerns about that, right? Um, so yeah, we're trying to sort of walk that line about use and usability and access. Interesting. I know we're trying to do some things like that here in Oregon with some of the um, fishery observations that we could be taking. So yeah. I was just curious. Okay, question online? Oh, you're being quiet online, everybody. Get your questions in there. Uh, thank you. Great presentation. Um, I'm curious, could you elaborate a little bit more on the start of this project? Because um, you you went over kind of the motions of the various meetings, discussion groups, meeting with the elders uh, approach. How, how did you, can you elaborate a little bit more on how you started that discussion? Yeah. Even just started thinking about that in that approach. Right. Um, I would love to hear more. And then also the um, the film, the, the film that you also discussed, that was also part of that project. Yeah. Um, so how do you start a knowledge co-production project with an Arctic community is probably the most important question that we get, right? Because I think there's a lot of people that are really sort of want, they want to do stuff like that. And um, they see examples and they also know that it's hard. Um, so, you know, in this case, we started with a relationship with the native village of Kotzebue. The native village of Kotzebue has an environmental program coordinator who is very active in science. Um, and so he was essentially like, there's this term boundary spanners, right? And um, so there's these, these people and organizations that can serve as connectors. And in that case, that was Alex Whiting. 
So uh, we, we, you know, we built a relationship as scientists with the native village of Kotzebue, talked about like, hey, you know, would it be interesting to develop a question, a research project um, with the tribe? And, and so there was sort of like a precursor to the actual project, if that makes sense. And so, it, it, and it's all built on relationships. Um, but even so, we had, I think it was about the first year and a half to two years before we actually had identified those six research questions. So we had really unique funding sources. Um, so that was the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, right? So we had foundation funding that took a, took a bit of a leap um, of, of faith in us to say like, yeah, you can write a proposal that doesn't have research questions or hypotheses outlined. We just had sort of, we wanna study sea ice change in Kotzebue Sound with the native village of Kotzebue. And, um, and they gave us the space to build those relationships to work together and identify the research questions. So that's not sort of historically how a lot of, I think, federal funding has, or funding agencies have, organ have, have sort of worked. Um, I think in the Arctic, we're starting to see a little bit of traction on that and some changes. Um, I'm less familiar in sort of other parts of the world. Um, and then your second question about the film, can, what, can you remind me what the question was? <laughs> Could you elaborate more on that film? Is it out? Is it available? What's the title? And... Yeah, yeah. So um, if you search YouTube for Ikag Vixikukin, um, you'll come across it. It's uh, the filmmaker is Farthest North Films. Um, there's a series of short films. So like, you know, just a few minutes to 15 minutes in length kind of thing. Probably about 12 of those that are about various parts of the project. I think they would actually be really great for different, you know, like teaching tools or something like that, right? And then there is a feature length film um, that's called Ice Edge that she also put together and kind of tells the whole story. It was, yeah, it was part of that project. All right, I've got a question online. Go ahead and use your mic, Katie. Uh, what? You're right, you don't have to put that close. Uh, what are some additional research questions that have come through um, while working on this interest and what's your pursuing option next? Yeah, so, you know, that was kind of maybe the, the, one of the challenging things to a project like Ecogvik Sakukin is like our funding ended and we hadn't actually answered all of the questions <laughs> that came up. So it's like created lots of opportunities to continue down the line. Um, and um, so in particular, like I have a lot of collaborations with the native village of Kotzebue and, um, and so we're pursuing some of those other questions and have new projects spinning up. Um, there are collaborators on some proposals that are in progress right now. Um, just for an example, we're just starting a project um, called the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observing Network or AMBON, right? So there's these bonds around the globe. Um, and so we're, we have the Arctic, we're part of the Arctic pro, uh, Marine Program. And um, so we're gonna be doing some eDNA sampling um, in Kotzebue Sound starting up this summer. Um, and it's kind of getting at this idea of like, what, what are we seeing in the observations in Kotzebue relative to some of the water samples that we'll be able to take and do biodiversity monitoring um, in Kotzebue Sound. So that's one example. Great. Okay, I know that we are running out of time. Um, so I think we have a couple of requests from, uh, for you to hang out just for a little bit so we can get some pictures. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say thank you to our speaker one last time, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks again so much for the invite. It's been so fun to be here. Great. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. For folks online, we're going to go ahead and end the presentation. Thanks for being here.